let's do whatever. We'll 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 jive into that, I suppose. All right. So now on. So we're live now. See that up there on the left hand? Do you see that, uh, Kevin, as well? I see it. Yep. Now click on go live on your Instagram side. On the actual in the, Instagram. In the top right, you should see it says, it's going to say end stream. Don't click end stream. Click right, right below where it says go live. You see that? No, I don't have that. Yeah. So. See, I think it connected it automatically because see all the green checks next to our name with the Instagram yeah. icon. Yeah, you're you guys are live on my Instagram side. So, so I would check your phone. Let me check real quick. See if it linked it. Yeah, it's, it's live. live on there. And it says you're live as well. I didn't see rubber duck. Oh yeah, I did see OK Calyx is live. Okay, yeah, we're good. Okay, great guys. Um, all right, dope. Well, obviously these things take a minute. The platforms take a minute to uh, for more people to kind of want to uh, figure out where you are and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, we uh, yeah for the for the people that are on here, we uh, kind of decided to go next level with a lot of this stuff. Um, so each and every week, we'll be improving this behind the scenes and starting to really educate the community how we want to. Where Instagram kind of. In I guess would say he limited us uh, with some of that creativity. Yeah, and uh, so we're going to be hopefully in the next coming weeks coming up with kind of like a collective uh, um, YouTube page that we can post to kind of unanimously and, and where everybody can go to kind of get this show. But for now, it's it's getting live streamed to my Instagram. It's also getting recorded uh, locally so we can upload like the full quality content and uh, everybody can upload it to their, their YouTubes if you guys wanted to do that. So that's pretty sweet. Um, What's up, Rick? Yeah, so uh, anyways, I'm just sorry. I'm just like trying to wrap my head around the technology in front of my face here i'll get past this here <laughs> um yeah it's all brand new it's all brand new we're figuring it out right now as we go you you are experiencing experiencing our failures and mistakes and everything so yeah um the point we're here the the reason we are here right now is to catch up with everybody uh collect some questions and hopefully have some points of conversation that we can all kind of um have something to talk about during this this podcast slash uh live stream here so uh until that uh we'd like to always kind of update each other on how the weeks are going and um hopefully that spawns a little bit of uh something for somebody to throw a question in but um kev what's going on in gasoline alley how's your guys weather it's actually really nice uh temperatures the lows are around 38 to 40 the highs gotten up close 70 71 so it's been super nice here and um i am let's see on sunday i will introduce my reversed chester the cheetah chesta the cheetah into gasoline alley and then i'll flip everybody else into flower also so that the reverse plant will be about two to three weeks ahead of everybody else so hopefully we can maximize on some pollen distribution and that that's the goal anyway to start that start the reversal early i have been i've made a ton of imo3 y'all i'm just i'm gonna what i think i'm gonna do is i'm gonna be going out in the woods pretty soon and just getting a lot of bark a lot of sponge wood and i'm just gonna bring the wheelbarrow right back to my my uh no-tills and take that chipper out there and just blast just wood chips all into the no-tills and not even make IMO3 with it. Just just get the wood chips in there. Those wood chips are inoculated, you know, like crazy. And I find in my gardening, when I have lots of good wood chips in there, I always have way more mushrooms that'll kind of sprout up. You know, just random mushrooms, whatever. I don't know any kind of mushroom it is, but a lot of a lot of good random mushrooms just pop up and it, and it comes along with all that good inoculated bark. But I've been drying a bunch of IMO3 
I, I told you guys earlier this week when we were texting that a bunch of grows have been shutting down and um i actually got four big eight eight foot long four foot wide flood trays you know i got those out of a dumpster i got like probably a hundred foot round little small drip trays we got a me i took it to scissor tail Savalis, his grow i got a, a 150 spot cloner that was just thrown in there because see what's happening is these warehouses that are rented out, all these growers have brought all of their equipment in. Everything they've bought is in there. And when they go belly up or they go bankrupt, it's basically easier for them just to say, cut all losses, we're gone. And therefore, the owners of the warehouse have to come in and they have to get those warehouses cleaned up and get them ready for the next renter. And they don't they don't sell anything. They just throw it in the dump. They don't have time to do that mess. They throw everything in the dump. I went and looked again today. <clears throat> there was a four by four tent, just basically a brand new one. Hadn't been used. It was just in the it, it had the, the the little vent screens and everything. There was a four by four and a two by four in there. Just brand new tents. They're just still throwing stuff out. And I just keep checking every day and getting all kinds of new stuff. But so I've been dumpster diving. I've been drying some old IMO3 and uh just preparing for the breeding stuff with belief to get ready, hoping I get some pollen released. It's always questionable when you have a reversal. You know, sometimes like Kid Mac, we were actually just getting a bunch of pollen off of one of his reverses today. He took it, um, he took it up to Scissor Tail Sobolus, and he doesn't have any plants in there, so there's no worry. But we went ahead and did the pollen um, removal today, and he got a pretty good amount of some of a reversal that he did. And so when you do fems, you never get as much pollen as you do a male, not even close. Often you have to work for the pollen. You got to take the sacks off and rub them on a screen and really work for the pollen. <clears throat> so um, that's what I mean. I'm hoping I get a good pollen distribution with my chest of the cheetah. So that's what I've been doing. What about you, Brian? Yeah, and you're always uh, hustling. And that's something that I admire about both of you guys is that I think once you're as an entrepreneur and you can go like start to spin a couple plates, then you you know you continue to add a couple more until you can't handle that. And then uh, these little projects that you may have started a year or two before they start to come to fruition. So for me, part of that is uh, putting together a project that's probably about a year and a half in the making of working with a company that's based out of the UK. Uh, and the this uh, uh, I guess they're like girlfriend and boyfriend, close to being fiance, uh, fiance. She's about to be a fiance uh, and, and we're going to uh, focus on terrariums and their company is called Terrarium Tribe. And so this is something huge for my wife and I, because it allows our company Rubber Ducky Isopods to now uh, become an international brand, have international exposure so that we can continue in, in true reality to kind of build the national brand and then get little uh, sprinkles of sales in the international level thinking next year and beyond where hopefully that will grow into something that is extremely uh, fruitful for the time and effort. Mark, uh, I almost said Marco. Mark, this is going to be yeah. uh, interesting. Yes. Uh, so let's see what's going on around here. It's been 50s the last couple days here as highs. <clears throat> So we were out in the garden today looking around, poking around in the leaves and stuff like that. And, uh, man, it's crazy how many lethargic worms are hanging out like two inches down. Um, and, like, a lot of life. And there's a lot of, like, mycelial growth going on, like, re like already. It's going to snow again. And, it's Jan it's, I mean, it's January. It's hard to believe it uh, here in Michigan. But, um so yeah, that's what's going on outside. Inside, I got some new uh, springtail species I've been working on. Um, some some arid species because I think that there's a need for that in the market. Uh, guys that like to hang out in like a desert type climate do well when there's very limited water and um, still ferocious eaters. So I found a couple species that I really like. Uh, one's called a woolly mammoth. And that like under a scope, they've got like fur all over the outside of them, and they're yeah, those are really cool, man. You really like dive cool. deep with this. It's fun. It's fun to hear you talk about it. Yeah, and then uh, some giant silver bullets is the other one. They're, they're dubious is in the name, the scientific name of these, 
Um, so I don't like they are big, man. They're like remind me of crickets almost. They're not like they're like probably one twelfth of the size of a cricket or one twentieth the size, much smaller than a cricket, you know. Um, but uh, active as can be, and yeah, super fun stuff going on. So, and just trying to market. Um, building uh i'm working with an artist to try to get some stickers for all like the different colors of springtails and like maybe when people buy those springtails they get that color sticker kind of like a collectible type de thing you know um something like that so i've been been definitely brainstorming hey so what i'm doing is i went on i went on my phone and i'm on youtube if you guys on instagram if you go to go to youtube and go to mi beneficials and you'll kind of be able to see it on youtube all, well you will be able to see it on youtube also and interact uh, interact that way so that's just another option because some people I are like hey i found you so i have uh i do have a couple questions from instagram because i have that feed up here or just one question actually if you guys want to dive into it um and again just for people filing in and hopefully we're reaching everybody um you know this will take some time like when you when we change platforms just realize that it's it's almost like you start all over again but that yeah the good part is that we have all the control to edit and stuff yeah, because I can't verify how good we are on uh, Instagram right now. So, um, what's but, the question? Uh, I'm sorry. Questions about hollow stems, hollow stocks. Uh, he's got some uh, Nelson seven 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 has some hollow stocks on a few outdoor plants. Is he missing something, or is that in the genetics? <laughs> Come to me. Uh... Yeah, I don't. I'd never worry about it. Like some of, some of my plants do have hollow stems, and some of them don't have hollow stems, and they will look green and pretty either way. So, just something I don't want to want to really want to put on my worry plate. But I'm sure that there is a better answer than that for you out there, and that's why I'm going to turn it over to my buddy Brian. I got to check a kid real quick, y'all. Yeah, I mean, hollow stems to me does kind of mean that there is something. There are genetics that have hollow stems. Uh, that's where the the slight twist, even when uh, in the early days, where you would like kind of like twist the main stalk, you bend those fibers, you hear it kind of snap a little bit. That's where a lot of that would even come from to kind of hear how uh, dense and feel how dense those stalks were. Um, but to me, it w would be potentially a, a variety of different. Uh, deficiencies to get it to that level of a hollow stock unless it's genetics that are perfect to do that yeah and i think outdoors that's an easy fix um not not to say that there is even a fix right like um some plants even from stem to stem like some stems will be hollow and some stems won't be hollow so I don't necessarily think uh, outdoors that there's so much to worry about, especially if it's only on a couple of them and you've got a bunch of plants going. Um, if it's all of them, and like, then maybe start thinking about using some whole plant, full spectrum, like JLF, like do some stuff like Kevin does, because there's a lot of stuff there in the biology of the plant that can not really necessarily be uh explain but at least if you are giving full a full board of of nutrients micronutrients the whole the whole board at least you know that it's genetics at that point you know i feel like if kevin you're correct me if i'm wrong but if you're coming across hollow stems you're not questioning much other than genetics i would think right yeah again i've had a I've had plants that are actually fairly big that do have hollow stems. I had a, I had a um, runaway Slurpee. It's blue tooth cross the berry cherry. I had it last year. I had two of them in my garden and one of them had hollow stems for quite some time. And I don't know if it grew out of it or not because I, I cut it down, but <clears throat> it was a healthy plant. I had a hollow stems again, no big deal. The only thing I've ever had a problem with is, talking of maybe a hollow stem is whenever I had a bigger trunk and I had a branch break off and it had a little hole that went up in there. 
I lost half of a plant because of that little hole. They de definitely something got into that area and started chewing on it. And, you know, weeks later, I started weeks later, a, a main branch and, you know, all everything off of it started to wilt and I cut it off. And when I chopped the plant down later on in the summertime, you could, I could split the whole base open and you could see where it was just rotted up and, and heading out that way. So that would be a problem with a, a hole in your stem. Yeah, and I think it also comes down to it, is the plant healthy? So like I was saying too, if, if you're Big worried head. about the hollow, you know, then start cracking the main stalk and doing the little tear of the fibers and stuff. If it is hollow and you kind of do it that way, it does seem to start those the, that bubbling. And then as the plant starts to grow out, it will create a, a bigger base for you. Uh, but other than that, man, I, I think just focusing on the soil, noticing um, if, if the leaves are healthy and praying, I just, again, try to refocus on feeding that soil system again. And, uh, it does kind of, you know, as the, as the years go by an assembly line. So we got to make sure that these plants are on point each and every time. And that is a very hard to do consistently. Uh, you know, month after month when it's maybe just yourself or maybe you and one other person. It's just a lot to ask uh, for the average person. So you want to focus on that soil that is kind of fueling the whole thing. Um, and I think the hollow stems uh, aspects will either fix itself or it's genetic or maybe it's just the way it's being grown right now. I mean, there's a lot to it's kind of the same thing with purple stems. I mean, you can almost kind of say the same thing. A lot of people have pros and cons on that man you could talk almost like a whole episode on why it's genetic and why it's not genetic and you know people have very strong opinions on both sides for our listeners and i think the way that i think most people that are rocking with this is more we're not necessarily the phd level uh human beings and so what we need is just show me how it works and tell me how it works so that i can replicate it i mean that's kind of like yeah. the whole point of peer-reviewed anything right okay calyx teaches it Somebody takes that information and then they they repeat it at home. Boom. Now, to me, that is exactly what uh, Mother Nature is about, is being able to be replicated by anybody. And so that's what I am excited for for this, especially with you, you know, at the helm of this, uh, Kevin, kind of just teaching the ways on a lot of this stuff in the in the early days for people that want to get to this and hopefully also monetize. it. Very good point. <clears throat> Pretty sure my purple yeah. stems come from my cheap veg like, you know, Rick, I had just like Brian was saying, I had a um, I had a plant also. I, I think I have a plant that almost every time anybody pops it, the stem is green, but the fan leaf stem is purple every single time. Doesn't matter if the plant is pH strong or not. It, it whenever whenever I grow it and it's grown right, the fan leaf stems are always purple. Now, to me, it's a bit of an irritant because I typically like my plants in veg to be totally dark, luscious green. No, no purples because here, here is a fact. If you get your pH off, the very, the very first sign you see are purple streaks. So purpling is definitely an indicator. However, there's, there's genetics that also just display purpling in veg and flower. But I can tell you for sure, your pH going off, you start seeing those purple streaks and all that stuff. And, and you can make it definitely, you, you can make your stems turn purple by the pH going off, which again, simply indicates a nutrient imbalance. Mark, you got something to add, bud? No, I think your point about, you know, gauging these kind of these minimal issues i would say with like a hollow stem uh, look at the whole plant you know if the plant's healthy then there's really nothing to worry about it's it probably is just genetic that's yeah, all i wanted to say about that just real at the beginning man just remember there's there's so many variables coming at you that it's just more just focus on a good flip quality harvest like if you kind of just dial into to one pigeonhole when you first get into this, then all you care about is yield. Then the quality suffers. If all of a sudden, you know, again, when you're brand new to this, if all you're focused on is quality, then the yield suffers because there's just too much. So you got to get out of your way with this kind of stuff. A lot of people brand new to this trip over themselves with trying to dial in a perfect system in basically 30 days, 60 days, and just realize that 
nothing in mother nature comes quick. I mean, I think that's why there's even seasons and, you know, you're supposed to even in the winter kind of like hibernate a little bit, if you will, and, and kind of reflect and all those kind of things. Uh, and mother nature does that, but, but we don't. And so if we're trying to replicate that in our gardens, uh, <laughs> that's something that I think more people will see as, uh, this is when the magic is happening. And if you can continue to add the organic matter, I've personally seen that over two years where I'm paying for leaves. I mean, I know that sounds comical, but I can't get magnolia leaves where I live. So I pay to get magnolia leaves. And then when I get those leaves, it gives me a leg up where I live at least because for whatever reason, tropical isopods in general love magnolia leaves, magnolia pods. Hmm. Which is why there's a product, uh, which is why there's a need for things like, uh, you know, beneficial packs, you know, or uh, IMO one, two, three, four, five, Bokashi, all these things, because there's people that live stacked on top of each other yep. in a concrete jungle that don't have a yard, you know, don't have the means to do these things. And, um, or, you know, s simply enough, like, their wives are just done with the stinky buckets, you know? Um, <clears throat> so, so, you know, it's nice to have the the, product, the finished product uh, uh, available on the market, but also know how to make it if you do get a yard. And I think that, like, know it, having that knowledge, like, every time you learn something more about gardening and you don't have your own garden like man doesn't that just want you doesn't that just push you to want like that garden a little bit more you know if nothing else so um yeah i wanted to give a shout out to um like cannabis farmers in general because i was at a pretty prestigious uh grow show yesterday then we went out for cocktails and some of these people were uh well to do around the city and they were talking about Dr. Lane Ingham. So my ears perked up because, you know, I talk about this shit all the time. And this one woman was talking about how she's just a, an amazing biodynamic farmer. And she just kept talking about biodynamic, biodynamic. And so then I, I, I politely kind of came in and was saying, like, you know, Dr. Lane Ingham isn't a biodynamic farmer. Uh, and then we all kind of had a little chuckle and stuff. And she, you know, but my point is that people that are making big time decisions, uh, people that seem to write the checkbooks for a lot of this stuff. If you actually kind of listen to what they're saying, they don't have the knowledge that a lot of us do. We just don't have the degree to get hired to where they got. Right. And so that's the kind of stuff that I hope to give insight with our audience is that you guys don't realize as a whole how intelligent this community is. And then when we sit around and we talk and we do this kind of stuff, if you do it that to the right people and the right people here, you kind of use the vernacular and understand Steiner and the difference between uh, Dr. Lane Ingham's viewpoint and Steiner's viewpoint. It impresses a lot of people because most people don't they're not able to walk the walk. And that was the one thing that I was learning about yesterday is that a lot of those big time farmers still to this day have no idea really how to farm unless they're using a a. Uh, synthetic formula that's been gifted to them by the company themselves. If you talk to them and pick their brain, they don't outside of brand names and that kind of stuff. It's, it almost seems very foreign. And so I just wanted to kind of give that cheerleader moment to this community that you guys are on a, a excuse me, a step ahead of a lot of the, the, the people that think that they have the knowledge. Uh, Cause when they regurgitate it, it is not, it's not even accurate. And so just there's something to that, man. I hope you guys see that. Yeah. <clears throat> there, here's one thing that's cool about kind of how the organic community is. It's like, it is like you'd said it earlier, Brian, it's kind of like a peer review group going on of organic methods being tested because like when I do all my stuff, um, you, you create a method, you implement it. And then you report on the findings, whether good or bad. And that's education that's brought to the academia of organics, if you will. 
And that's the way it should be done. That's the way you kind of try to think. Like I always tell you that you get to be your organics should be experimental because all of our environments are different and all methods won't apply equally across the board in all different environments. And so as you get into your environment and you start understanding what Mother Nature is offering in in terms of uh, materials to use as inputs and, and to make in soils, once you start understanding what she's given you, you start experiment with it and you start trying acorn IMO or walnut IMO3 or <clears throat> you get into trying to ferment different types of materials like sponge wood, like I do, and kind of make a bokashi out of certain materials. But your your environment won't look like mine. I, you won't be able to do the things that I can do in my environment. And I can't do the things you can do in your environment. And some people don't even have an environment like Mark was saying. Some people live in an apartment and have nothing. And they rely on people like us to kind of provide things and just kind of help you help you out. But when you do experiment and you and you figure something out, the best thing for our community to do is to just to show it and to show what you did with it and to kind of just be like, I think it worked. You know, two weeks, everything looks good. Well, good, because your environment might be kind of like mine and that might give me a little jump start on some method or, you know, something that will work in my own environment. So that's the way peer tested things work. And I, I know this because I've earned my doctorate. I understand how these things work. I understand implementing projects. I understand pre-testing knowledge before the project, post-testing knowledge after the project, measuring the increase in knowledge, you know, actually seeing it through an through answered questions. But you can treat our our community, and that's what I do. I treat our community like that. I do things and I'm like, here's what it did. Check it out. I just tried it. It was awesome and fun. And, you know, I tell people, try something, name it, get a name to it, because it's always a fun thing to do in organics is get to name your little method you do, and then tell us if it worked or not. If it didn't work, is just as much valuable knowledge as if it did. You know, that cuts out the landmines that some of us won't have to step on later on if you let us know if it didn't work, too. So that's what I have to say about our community. It's very valuable if you'll use it that way. I agree. And we have some people logging on to YouTube. So this is sweet. We got some questions rolling in. Um, this is a cool question. Thoughts on springtails in organic grows. Is there good and bads? Example, ones that break down matter versus eating roots. <clears throat> you want to go first? Uh, and you go first for sure. All right, so I've been using springtails since we found out about this. And um, at the beginning, when before we had it, we had straw and we were still even using springtails. So we've been using it for a long time. We would water them so much. Uh, some of the real, like almost like overachieving bins, when you would water it, we would joke that it looked like Christmas morning. So we've had them to where there were just a couple springtails running through there and then thousands of them running through there. And as long as the organic matter is there, chop and drop, giving extra sugar leaves, I've noticed too with springtails and road beetles, even in the early days, uh, that little extra sugar that's on some of those, uh, you know, if you're doing it right, on the on the uh, fan leaves and veg, they seem to love to devour that, isopods as well. So if you're able to kind of get that springtails population up, it does seem like eventually they will self-populate like uh, composting worms. I've never heard anybody say that about springtails, but I'm sure Mark could also co-sign that there's not enough information on them outside of like academia and kind of breaking down what they do and those things. But from a real experience standpoint, I believe that Mark is at the forefront of a lot of the, the breeding of the, the colored species. And so you guys are going to get a major insight here uh, into what it takes to breed kind of, to be honest, real hard finicky uh, uh, springtails. And so to, Get back to this question. Are springtails bad? I've personally never found any issue whatsoever. The only time I've ever seen where springtails are bad is if you Google springtails, the first things that pop up in the Google uh, page one is how to get rid of them. It's like Orchid and some of these other art, uh, big name companies have wrote articles and blogs about it. But the exact opposite is where you're trying to get with living soil systems is that springtails are a necessity in my opinion to work in a symbiotic relationship with composting worms and if you want to go next level obviously with isopods to be the decomposers and again the decomposers are the one that make the money in the system they break it down into carbon 
And so if everybody's running around with more money, then everybody feels a little bit better about life. And that is what we were talking about in these worlds upon worlds upon worlds. And so I've never been worried about a springtail system. I, again, if it gets, seems like it's Christmas morning when you're watering, I would back off a little bit, uh, maybe not feed as much. So it does seem like they'll self-regulate. Uh, and now to even self-regulate at this point, I've learned from Mark to just throw uh, some rogue beetles in there with some avocado tech. And it seems like even four or five rogue beetles will, will take care of, I don't know, I don't know about that, but maybe tens or hundreds of, of uh, springtails per week, seems like. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, um, so the so crazy thing after raising uh, just regular white, you know, Fulsomia, Canada, like your regular commercial white which is funny to say because it's not really commercial but like raising them at a commercial level after two years of doing this <clears throat> the thing that i've learned about springtails in a cultured setting is that they will boom and bust in population within days right like they have <clears throat> I, I can't remember the exact uh life cycle of them off the top of my head but it's for that species, it's not necessarily that long for them to go from like uh, an egg to a like functioning adult uh, springtail. So when they're when they're choked out on food <clears throat> in a cultured setting, right? Like when I neglect my cultures, whereas I like I feed them every two, three days. I'll blow my populations through the roof. If I feed them every six, seven days, they'll live. They'll still be people alive, but they won't, they won't boom. They will completely crash out. So you'll be left with like a 10th of your culture. Um, so like you're able to actually like kind of like step on the gas pedal with them. If you want to feed them aggressively, do it every two, three days so that's the whites. Now this question, I wonder if he's talking about colored ones, because I love the colored ones, and I've been playing with those now for probably six months. And um, <clears throat> the thing that I've learned with those is um, your big like tropical colored ones, the, the oranges and the reds, they're probably not going to do that good in a living soil system where you want to boom uh, biodiversity, where you have a, a good population of predators, you have a good population of a whole bunch of other competitors. These guys take weeks, if not months, to go through reproductive cycles. So they're not going to do great in that environment where it's like heavily c competitive. They do okay in like a cultured setting when you have all the things right. Um, but there are species that will do good. And like one of them, I would say for sure is going to be like the, the blue, pr the blue Padura. It's super small, tiny, tiny, tiny little guy, but they are so ferocious eaters like that. I could feed them every day and I wouldn't be overfeeding those cultures because they're so like, they're so aggressive at eating. Um, and they're not, they're not a a lot they're not like phytophagus meaning they don't eat living plant matter they eat de detritus like organic breaking down matter so um well well said you like when he says uh break down organic matter versus eating roots i've never seen springtails even over populations start to eat healthy live roots uh, so the only time that I, they would they would do that i think is if you let them get out of control somehow and you're new to this uh Mark, I, you had something to add on that? No, I mean, I, I don't... I, somebody sent me a picture of, of an insect that looked like it was eating a plant that could have potentially been like some weird morph of a springtail, and I could never figure out what it was. But other than that, I've never heard of springtails, like unless you're in some... like some extraordinary circumstance you're you're probably thousand percent okay and 
But I guess the point I was trying to make right, with the like the culture, uh, like saying like if I feed it every two to three days, and every seven days where they ebb and flow, that's how quick they ebb and flow. So if you're overwatering and overfeeding things, they're going to boom. Like because like that's just how they work if there's like an excess of food they're going to there's going to be an excess of them so almost think of them as like your good army like hope that they're there instead of fungus gnat larva and all that other shit you know thrips and root aphids and all that other fun stuff so you got a uh, great answer man we got a question uh, for Kevin here from Broke, Broke Inspector. Uh, I recently, recently had, had a, oh yeah, go for it. Man. Sorry, I recently had a friend give me about a dozen bags of grains prepped already. Could I use those for Bokashi or CO two? How would I go about to activate it? I don't know what prepped already means, but a dozen bag of grains kind of depend on the time of year. Um, in the i mean i would here's what you could do you can make a jms with the grains you soak them in water for a few days you need some heat though to kind of set it off you can have make a grain jms with it and when you strain off the jms liquid jadon microbial solution when you strain it off what i do is i set those grains out on a burlap sack and i'll get them about an inch thick just across the burlap sack and let them kind of dry. And I have that out on the ground out by my shed. And what that actually does is it will, it'll attract a uh, row beetle, baby row beetles will be all up in those grains within a week or so. And the grains will kind of harden and you can just cut them. And it, that's what I use. I do that with what's called scratch grains. Those of y'all have chickens, you know what scratch grains are just a lot of different, different types of grains. And that's just the leftovers for, chickens to eat but there's plenty of starch and stuff in them and they'll they'll create a jms for you then how do you inoculate it well the easiest way would be to bokashi style it which means you could you get a you know get a big bunch of those grains and what i do is this you take a pint of labs and a pint of molasses and you pour both of those pints into a five gallon bucket full of water Mix that up, and that's going to be your your fermenting sauce. And you can put, you can use as much or as little as you need to, depending on the amount of grains you're using. More grains, you'll need to use more of the liquid. Less, you use less liquid. But that would be a bokashi style that you could use. It would take you two weeks to anaerobically ferment that in a sealed trash bag. Uh, but in two weeks, you would have grains that are highly inoculated with lactobacillus acids or lactobacillus bacteria. <clears throat> When you make a JMS, I'm sure it releases CO2, <clears throat> but, you know, I don't know if the grains have been spent. Does that mean this guy made beer with them and, you know, they've been, they've been boiled, like what you do with grain when you make beer? It just kind of depends on what kind of, you know, what, what state they're in also. And what grains. Yeah, I mean, like you said, like you said, what, you know, is it barley? Because that needs to be hauled potentially or sprouted ideally. Yeah. Um, you don't want yeah, to sprout th teas. Trust me. Trust me when I say you do not want to throw down fucking uh, two row or e even two. Well, two row is is kiln dried and all that. That's the point of two row. But um, if you have just regular barley, do not throw that down because it sprouts like crazy. That's why it's such a great um, uh, addition as a as a as an amendment broken down like hulled, uh, which is like which is what you do with nuts sh uh, like shells and stuff from the nuts that you find around uh, your area, Kev. Um, because otherwise, those especially like the walnuts and what 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 other nuts do you get, Kev? Acorns. Acorns, Acorns, yeah. Walnuts, hickory nuts, black. Uh, we get black walnuts. Uh, there's probably more, but there's just plenty there. So, like, w without breaking those shells down, um, it's almost like it's it's 
definitely not like a usable amendment in like heavy doses you know it needs to it, it would take forever to break down in its natural state so like stuff like that being processed definitely adds a huge um advantage and lets you unlocks your potential with the stuff that you have really yeah yeah the meat inside is what the microbiology really gets after that's the carbohydrates that's got the sugars that can break down and, and produce food for those guys the outer husk of those nuts you know that's going to be harder material carbon material whatever whatever might make that shell up uh but it's going to take longer for biology to chew through that stuff. So you, all, all you're doing, guys, when we when we recreate IMOs, like IMO3, IMO4, IMO5, and I say recreate because we're actually just recreating what nature already does. You can go out there and find IMO3 out in the field, IMO4 out in the field. <clears throat> but we're, re, we're recreating it. All we're doing is gathering those nuts and gathering those twigs and leaves and stuff, and we're applying heat. We're applying moisture and we're doing it at a at a at an even steady rate that that the that Mother Nature has prepared. You know, it's that range of heat and moisture that microbiology love. And we're just keeping them there in a state in a in a tote for me, usually, keeping it in a warm and moist in a tote. And we can actually do what Mother Nature does better than Mother Nature does it. We can manipulate what she has taught us, right? We can manipulate it and boil it down into exactly what we need. We don't have nights of cool, right? We don't have we don't have anybody affecting anything. Nothing's affecting that tote. It's perfect conditions. And so we speed Mother Nature up really fast. And so that's the that's the idea of those IMO one, two, three, four, five. It was we're just reproducing Mother Nature. And when you make those things, you want to crush, you want to crush, 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 because you're dealing with little bitty minute biology, you know, and you're trying to get lots of surface area for them to be able to get into, not just one round of shell. You want that thing busted into a hundred pieces and they can chew on what they want. Yeah, I mean, um, sprouted and then crushed seed meal is what Benny Boost is. And and there is make no exception about it. There's no no smoke and mirrors here. Like that's literally how I have thriving row of beetles. That's how I crush with with all my beneficials. Is just balancing diets and and steering <clears throat> the ecosystems inside. Kind of like you do with your IMOs, man. Like you're just cheating Mother Nature just a little bit, cutting cutting a corner, you know. Um, so, Did not enough. Sorry, not enough to be said about uh, about seed meals, seeds, nuts, all that. Sorry, Brian. I thought you were uh, getting with your thought, but. Uh, when it comes to the the rogue beetles, I think you did find the secret sauce, Mark, in the fact that you're feeding them a, a solid food source. But with the springtails, at least I found more success now that they're hunting the live part as well. And I think that's what we were talking about last week on Instagram. And I would imagine most of the people will uh, have missed that from last week. So there is a lot of information on breeding uh, rogue beetles on the Internet. I've tried, uh, I think, the majority of them. And for me, it's been focusing more on fats, uh, actually, and then kind of just allowing them to eat uh, whatever the soft bodied insects are in there and then sprinkling those springtails so that they have a constant food source and then a living food source that they get to hunt and chase. And, you know, whatever that is to that little world, it does seem like it picks things up. And then eventually there's more springtails, there's more rove beetles. And again, you can continue to build upon that with the avocado tech. There's just something to those fats uh, that everybody in that, especially a brand new living soil system, they can't believe that all of that is sitting right there. Everybody wants to come from all over that system. And then when it goes away, everybody goes back and tries to find another avocado. So bouncing them around, just playing around with your worm bins, kicking off this year, I think is something fun where um, I think more of us, uh, you know, especially, I guess I'm I should say for myself, I want to show you guys more of what I guess under the hood with some of this stuff. And the worm bin to me is that that catalyst. 
Uh, I don't think a lot of people, even when we say this, that they realize that how quickly I could change a system. I could buy a, a, another man's company and quickly get it back to where I want it to be and not have these, you know, 12 moths flying out of every single bin that this gentleman has because he doesn't have a living soil system because everything in there is an inert ingredient. So these skill sets, these IMOs, these little things, these buying of time that I can add and you guys can add to your cannabis systems, to your reptile systems, to your isopods, especially designer isopod systems. In my opinion, the designer isopods are the finicky ones. And a lot of us that have bred them at any kind of level would agree with that. And so we need these upper echelon elements, amendments uh, to get to the next level. The bee nectars and the, and the extra crab meals and the insect frass. What insect frass are we using? Because we've removed the cricket. And I, once we did that, it seems like everything's a little bit cleaner. So, I mean, there's definitely levels to everything that we're going to talk about on this podcast I just hope that more people see that it's more attainable in this way. Not everybody gets to be the commercial farmer, and that is a hard pill to swallow. It was a hard pill for me for a couple of years to swallow. But then when you flip it around and you kind of put your boots back on and you step up, you're like, man, I can make a lot of this stuff myself. And if I don't have time to make whatever little tool set I need, you know, plugging yourself on Instagram is how you're going to be able to purchase it and barter it. I mean, that's... I think it's almost endless to this community, the people that are with us every Friday, guys, uh, that hopefully they'll see the light at some point and be able to create some little product and then run with it. <clears throat> Put that question up again. What's about horsetail? There it is. There it is. Thoughts on horsetail for silica supplement. Would JLF be a good way to extract it? Yeah. Horsetail, um, it's a medicinal plant. It's actually used as a diuretic. It makes you pee. That's what I've understood, but I don't, I've don't. i never taken I've seen it growing around here. Yes, I use, I use, um, I don't use horsetail, but I use uh, baby bamboo shoots. Fresh bamboo shoots, greenish, softish bamboo shoots uh, in the springtime. I always make a JLF like that, and I'll just dump that into my big JLF buckets. <clears throat> um so yes, use it for a silica supplement. JLF is one way to do it. Another way is a plant extract by filling a bucket with water and horsetail and then adding some labs and a little bit of molasses and in about seven Fermenta. days, strain the liquid off. Yep. So let me ask you this, Kev. Um, <clears throat> do you think that is it the silica is coming from that hard outer shell right because horsetail is like a real prickly kind of coarse plant um i'm sure that there's other plants kind of like quillaya it just came out of nowhere for for its you know saponins or whatever but like there's got to be other plants uh, geographically around the country that just have that spiny property that you can use for yeah. for silica and, and, and somebody's probably maybe not written about it but just try it and maybe if your plants respond well fuck man yep exactly it's... give it a try any any plant that you see that has that hard stemmy thing a green a green plant that is hard outer stem like mark was saying silica hardens cell walls and so that's why that plant can be hard like that it's probably because it's high in silica and it's cell walls so use it accordingly. So uh, let's see. Her Rick easily said, "Heard coconut leaves have saponins." I don't know. Maybe, probably. Boil them down. See if it gets slimy. Um, I know it's got. It's gonna have like good hormones and cytokinins and also potassium and you know stuff like that um i don't think we missed any questions i was hoping we could talk more about like what this channel we hope the three of us you know yeah. we hope this channel can become because uh you know you're limited when you have certain things or you know to be honest, I mean, I like talking about cannabis, but it's not my entire life. And uh, sometimes when you do try to have other ideas and concepts, people, not everybody's into it. 
So we're at this channel, I think that more people could see that on a microcosm scale, again, there's there's real opportunity for people that kind of hear this. And in my opinion, it's like getting on the ground floor of a potential movement that you saw already happen in the cannabis space. And so if you believe that that could potentially happen in the reptile space, I'm all in on this. And that's why I'm shouting it from the hilltops is that not everybody has the money to pay for even a, a large basement grow. But to build vivariums and flip vivariums and the, the, all, I mean, it's endless to, to grow the IMOs and make it yourself and have uh, one of the best uh, out there. I mean, you know, there's starting to be a lot of Mount, uh, Mount Rushmore's of IMO. Uh, there's just a lot of bright minds behind it. And the fact that uh, Kevin's just going to sit down here and kind of give you the playbook, uh, that's very rare in life. Usually people that are successful and that are kind of on the up, which is another thing about Kevin is this that this guy's doing all this on the up of life. You know, his stuff is his stock is growing. His Instagram is growing. His everything is usually people don't want to give at that point. So this is something that I hope that people see that this channel hopefully will be something rare. Uh, and you guys will hope also see in real time how businesses can grow. And over just a few six months or two to a year, even what, uh, you know, just a couple sales a day come to maybe five, six sales a day, just the same yeah. way. Old school flips, you know, you do an eighth to a quarter to an ounce to a to a QP to a pound. And if you repeat that cycle, I mean, you can make some money for yourself. Well, all the, that's kind of gone, especially for me. Right. So speaking for myself, I had to learn how to hustle again. How do we hustle as an old man in a digital age? And that is e-commerce. And those are the other skills that we want to give to you guys is because all of us are figuring that in real time. We didn't even know how to do this kind of stuff. That's why this first show feels kind of awkward. And we don't know how to kind of do the flow yet on YouTube. But I promise you that we're just going to get it started and we're going to make mistakes and we're going to have awkward uh, dead air pauses and all the things you're not supposed to do in a podcast, but that's okay because we're actually getting it done. And as the weeks go by and you guys see us putting in the time and effort, that's the same thing behind the scenes that we're doing with our businesses. And that's why we can continue to put more and more time into educating because it does give back. I mean, it feels good to give, but eventually it comes back. It almost in a way, whether you want it to or not, Yesterday, I might have met somebody just from a friend and always being homies with somebody that could potentially around my locally local area change my life. I literally changed my life from just meeting one person. And so that's that kind of stuff where I'm fired up to come talk to you guys now on a Friday because this kind of stuff just keeps falling into my lap. And I've never mm -hmm. believed in any of this kind of stuff and it continues to happen. And so for whatever reason, right? I want you guys to see that wherever your belief systems are and all of that stuff. I want you to see that just being a good human being, putting out good karma, showing up to work every day, being a man and providing for your family. Eventually, that shit comes back to you. And I want you guys to see that in real time. You're going to see that this year with this show. So that was well my said. Idea. Well said. Yeah, there's more. There's much more to life than growing cannabis. <clears throat> cannabis is one one area that helps me in my mental health it's one of the reasons that i got into cannabis was because of poor mental health that i had i had poor thinking skills i had repetitive looping thoughts that were destructive and negative didn't even realize i was doing these things and cannabis actually has helped me inspect my own self a little bit and just kind of start to realize I want a different life. I want to change. I want, there is something that's more fun than, than the party life and the, and, and the hunt for temporary joys. It's, there's bigger, better things that bring a longer lasting joy and a peace in life. And that, now that'll be, that'll be the things I like to discuss. I like that aspect. I like that side of everything, anything I see, anything I do, I try to see it through that lens of that mental health and how can we get to a place where my circle benefits. Everyone in my circle benefits. That's how I become a healthy person. I don't have anybody that's dragging behind. Everybody's participating. Everybody's feeling good. I'm helping as much as I can. I'm seeing you benefit. Then that helps me out also. So that's right. <clears throat> There's a lot of ways that we can encourage one another to be better human beings, whether it's through growing cannabis, whether it's through learning about isopods and all kinds of beneficials 
or whether again it's from me man learning what it's like to have five kids i mean brian you're catching up with me quick but right now i got the trophy for the mosties i got five of them and that man you know when you, you go, go keep that title dog i can't come I'm on gonna retire <laughs> I shoot them out two at a time, man. You shoot out twins, man. You start exponentially going up. But whenever, uh, whenever we're growing cannabis, what I was going to say this earlier when you were talking, Brian, um, everybody gets to have a different style and don't, don't get hung up on, you know, certain rules or things that you feel like you should do, whether you have to have an inline fan or not, or you need your humidifier and all this, you need to figure out your environment. <clears throat> but, Oh gosh, I was gonna say, dang, I lost it, Brian. Um, wor working within your working within your environment, you have to figure out you too. And my point here here's an example uh, by way of anecdote. I I hate watering. There might be a lot of people that hate watering, but I know I hate watering. I know if I grow in small pots, I'm gonna have to water a lot more, and that's gonna cause me problems later on down the line. So. Cannabis will also gardening in in general will help you understand if you're kind of lazy in some areas. We all are. We're lazy in some areas. We're all lazy in some and strong in others. But you'll start to realize what are my lazy areas? Do I get out here early in the morning? Do I do, on my tomato plants? Do I pull all the lowers off so I don't get blight, or do I just kind of let it go? You know, because that's the person you are. And so you have to learn to work with yourself. You're not going to change at all. You're you. You just got to learn how to work within your environment and what comes at what comes your way. You got to learn to deal with it in your way. Like reading a book will help. Getting knowledge will help. But don't think that their way is going to be your way and it's going to be a successful way. You got to learn who you are, learn your habits, learn where you're lazy and then get your grow kind of based on how you how you live and how you operate. If you got five kids, you don't have as much time as a person's got one kids or no kids. So you can have an easier, more flexible schedule. So that, that's my point. Know who you are will be even beneficial to your grow. Not only beneficial to you, knowing who you are in your mind, knowing who you are benefits you and your growing and your gardening and your child raising and your marriage, everything. So I think that uh, I think that we're like kind of on course for what the mission is right like it's we're not trying to to silo or compartmentalize ourselves into uh you know one aspect of hobbies or even life right um and it's kind of an interesting perspective coming from three dads and kev you're kind of you're a stay-home dad brian you're a working from home slash stay home dad i'm a working from home slash stay home dad it's it's an interesting perspective coming from that side of things um and uh yeah i think this is just a welcoming place that across the board uh and i think that the point that i would love in my mission in life not in life but just in like business maybe is to is to cross that gap saying hey you know bioactive enclosures is not synonymous or <clears throat> singular to uh reptiles or isopods or having a terrarium in your house it's it's parallel it's um it goes hand in hand with having a a, a thriving living soil in your garden um, especially when it comes to like indoor gardening too, you know, cause like they're, they're both in a controlled environment. Um, but also like it helps you to understand what's going on outside when you have these environments inside and you can see what's going on and how they react to the things that you're doing. So, um, I think <clears throat> like you guys good with bioactive live Q and a is the name, I guess you know, would be. I was just to say, I, I've learned that, uh, again, you just like start, you just start. And then uh, even like uh, famous brands like Starbucks, you know how many times those guys have changed their logos and like people rebrand. I think, I think it's more about just getting started. I definitely think that more people need to use or we should use the word bioactive because I do think that's a way that 
if some of you want to ride that wave with us, uh, let's let's all go out there and do it because there's definitely not enough people that even understand it yet. Uh, I think this is inside information that we guys give you sitting here like we were pitching you stocks or something or whatever the equivalent would be. But you get to control all of it. You don't have to give us shit. You get to pick. You get to study. You get to decide if you want to do it and, and ride that wave. And if it's in your town and you feel like you can monetize things to do it. I think you have to go to these expos to see for yourself that this economy exists. That's why I encouraged Mark to go to his first one a couple of weeks ago. Now he sees for himself that the economy exists for whatever reason, man, people are into this shit. And now that I'm into my little niche of it, I love doing the ice pots. I mean, there's just something to if you get into it or the springtails. I mean, open, cracking open a springtail thing and seeing 100 little red ones running around when you know that most people can't get 25. There's something cool to that. Uh, there's something special to it. It's almost like, you know, we, we got our own little niche that we might be able to hold on to and not have to uh, give up so much of our properties or our lifestyles or our family life because the mission is just too big for one person to accomplish. Well, on the smaller scale of things, especially going to the smaller reptile type expos, you can afford the, the or most of us can afford the tables. Right. So, I mean, some of the bigger ones are pretty expensive, but you can start out at the smaller ones. My, that's how my wife and I did it. I almost said it like, hey, this is triple A ball. We're going to see how we do here. Then we're going to hit the minor leagues. When we hit the minor leagues, we can get to the majors. I'm not even in the majors yet. And, and there's something to just sitting in the minors and starting to see some of these people come and go. Uh, so just man, I'm excited for this to kind of just hopefully see that other people pop up as as uh entrepreneurs through just using mother nature outside of just cannabis because so many of us in life were kind of jaded in the fact that we weren't able to make these healthy livings for ourselves with all the time and effort that we put into cannabis and it did seem like every time somebody would get enough information off you they would just want to go to the next person and so everybody felt jaded for a while too even in some of the commercial living soil uh, circles because everybody felt like that everybody's ripping off each other and everybody's making all these courses and all this kind of stuff where this is a new frontier. Uh, this is something where I think the, the cream of the crop can rise because it's a very, very small circle. And so if you just treat people with respect, you have a quality brand that people will begin to uh, respect, you can easily start to rise up in your little hometown and uh, for a lot of you, even just uh, being known in your state will be enough sales uh, to pay for your car note or eventually pay for that that mortgage. Uh, and then you're really on to something. And I promise you it exists and it's it's um, attainable. And I'll tell you right now, there's lots of people in your town that garden and they use they use um, uh, miracle Grow. They'll use potted soil, they'll use bag soil on all that stuff. And they don't know, they think that is how you grow. They think you have to do those things. There's a, there is a learning curve that is so flat right now for people growing their own food. Just learning even how to till the ground, get it started and then start layering and all, all kinds of stuff. They don't know how to grow their own food. You know, when, when the SHIT hits the fan, and everything goes south as a culture, people are gonna realize that they have no idea how to provide for themselves. We are so we are we're so created to go to the store and get an immediate food. We don't think of any long-term plans for sustainability, nothing like that. So my point is this: if you have some knowledge of what we're talking about, about how to create your own soils, like we're, like I teach you how to create your own fertilizers, how to begin growing, how to maintain those uh, good soils with what these two boys offer also. You can spread that knowledge and you can do a class. Y'all seen Marco do it, man. I don't know what he charges, but he opens his own property up and has a class of 15 people out there. Say he charges 50 bucks for each person just to come out and get his wisdom and go home with some of his IMO3. That was way worth 50 bucks. But you made some good money so all you did was share your knowledge and a little bit of your product that you already make so <clears throat> just a word of encouragement to some of you out there man put a sign up in your yard go to um let's say i mean because i've done i'm doing the same stuff 
there's a place called 181 Ranch out here uh, by my place, and they I just saw their advertisement, and in their advertisement it said we help create knowledge of growing food. I was like, perfect, I will fit right in with that. So I'm getting a little booklet, you know, some pictures of what I do and what I should, what I can teach, and just say, hey, you and I have a great partnership ahead of us. I can already tell because we both have the same things in common. How can we make this work? And that's how we be. That's how I'll begin a class, you know, out there. Get 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 me five people that just bring me twenty dollar bill. I made a hundred dollars doing what I love to do. Go home, you know, put gas in the car. And it's just a weekend, and I'll do that another weekend. I do it on Wednesday night when people can meet again. So just you have opportunities because you have or you have knowledge of soil and of growing that most people just do not have at all. And that's the price that it should be, you know, like if it's 50, hundred bucks, people will respect your time. It's just sometimes when they're overpriced, um, you know, that, that, that makes people feel a certain way. So make it so that people can come to your class, do more of the classes, charge 50 bucks. I mean, I'm literally doing a class on March 3rd where there's three price points. I learned that in a little marketing class as well. You always have a good, better, best so that somebody feels like they have options. The medium choice is usually what people pick. So you want to make sure that that one actually is packed with a lot of extra goodies. Uh, and then the people that have a little extra money in their pocket, if they see value in the upper echelon, that's where you actually make a little bit of your profit. And so you can teach these classes again with uh, of, you know those three different price points. Maybe it's 10 bucks to show up at the class, 25 bucks with materials and 50 bucks where it's already made for you. And you kind of just think of it that way. And then you start off slow. Um, th there's just endless things. And I, I wish I would have met you guys, you know, in my 20s, because the guys that I were hanging out in my 20s, we weren't doing anything positive. And uh, looking back, I mean, what a what a waste. I mean, just to sit there and kind of just just years go by where I, I don't even know really what I was doing. And I, I'm sure you guys have certain moments in your life where you kind of felt that same way with you know, whatever was taking away your mindset. So I really do focus on the everyday counts. You know, you're, you're the, the only business is repeat business. Those are like my own little mottos that I've kind of come up with. Uh, and I just repeat them in my head because without those two things, I don't know if I would be able to continue every single day. I mean, with with four kids, it's, it's laughable. But then with five kids, I mean, each one of them is crazy. And Mark's got two. So, I mean, he knows that like these little universes collide with each other. And now you got three of them that collide, four of them that collide, five of them. It's, it's endless. So you start to hone your skills of how quickly you can get these things done. Because you know you only have so many hours Why you know, my one-year-old is sleeping before she starts losing her shit. And it's hard to concentrate uh, when, when a baby's screaming next to her. So those are the little things that um, I think if you're young and you're watching this over the, you know, especially the playbacks. And I hope that a year from now, people will go back and watch this inaugural episode and see how kind of uh, silly it was and uh, unprepared so that you guys can see how polished we are a year from now, almost like a little time capsule here. Um, Cause the year's already gone by where we were doing this on Instagram. Uh, and, and it was fantastic and we weren't able to record any of that stuff. And so now that we are going to be able to do that, it's a game changer, I think, for a lot of people that want to follow what we talk about uh, and just enjoy their Fridays instead of going out like uh, Kevin had mentioned. Because being a fool sometimes, I mean, compounds over the years. Well said, Brian. That's a great, probably a good point of sign off um and uh i think that uh the mission probably now is to try to drive people over to the youtube side because i've got we've i've seen a few comments now that like you, youtube is just way way better as far as you know playback and um People being able to uh, actually watch the show is a great, you know, positive. So um, I'll be trying to, like, push people towards the YouTube side of things. But what I just realized is that all three of us can, we can multi-stream to, like, eight different things. So you guys have admin rights to log in so you'll need to log in to 
uh, stream yard, I think. We have to figure that out. The thumbs don't do anything, though. <clears throat> Can't get them to do nothing. No, it's not. Yeah, bad. that's what Instagram's focused on. Not the clarity of their videos. Huh? Yeah, they're poofy foo-foos and stuff. The foo-skis. Tchotchkes. Yeah, dude, um, Brian just gave you I want to point that out. Brian gave it. I don't know if anybody listened to that, but Brian gave you all a business plan back there. Just to get <clears throat> to get yourself three three offers for people. It, they, go back and listen to it. But if, like I said, if you're in your own environment and you're working it organically, you're trying to figure out what Mother Nature offers you, you're experimenting with it, with, you know, with balance in mind, you're going to create something that no one else is going to be able to create simply because it's your own environment. That's when you're able to say, hey, I got a product. I want you to try it. Here's a free bottle of it. Send it on out. Send it in a mason jar like I do. Let people have some and try some. And then you actually begin. You you know what? Another point is you don't even understand how the mailing stuff works and the price that it costs to mail these things, the boxes you have to use, the tapes and all the stuff that you're going to use. That's something else you'll get into and you'll begin to learn as a business person just by sending a few a little bit of your product to somebody for no cost. You start to learn that whole shipping side of things, which is a big factor in any small business that participates in shipping product. So yeah, he gave you a nice little business plan, make your own specific product, send me a little bit, I'll try it, and then you can start selling it to your buddies. I mean, it's a business guy. This is how we do. If if you're if if there's something in you saying, yeah, but I don't like making money off of this, well, then you need to get past that because this is where you benefit from your own talents. Your own abilities are about to start paying off for you if you'll use them correctly and wisely. If you'll use your own wisdom and knowledge and get into your environment and make something awesome, you will benefit from that if you can if you can reap financially from it. The minute and the world goes around on money. That's all there is to it. People can people can say whatever they want to about it, but the point is I have to pay a lot of bills. I like doing organics. Wow, I just I just solved a problem. I'm going to make money by doing organics. You know what I'm saying? So he gave you a business plan. I, we all encourage you to get after it. We're all small business guys who are who are finding our lane, but we all encourage you as good human beings to better yourself and your family if you possibly can. Yeah, that's why we want to sh show this in real time. I mean, there's really a year from now, like this time capsule kind of analogy or whatever. A year from now, I promise you guys will see that our businesses have changed. Things have grown uh, because of the consistency. And so if you guys are willing to show up every Friday with consistency, then I know you're going to be uh, willing to show up for yourself with consistency. And that's really the biggest difference of being an entrepreneur is nobody wakes you up, man. And I, if you struggle with selling something for money, Look at the flip side. I even had a guy that was, uh, an, I guess, more of like an OG. And I hope you guys know the difference between an OG and a mentor. But more of an OG with that kind of stuff. And he was uh, later in life talking about how when you're trading your time, the most precious thing that you have as a human being for money, there is no other bullshit out there. That is the ultimate what the fuck. Because that is the precious thing that you have, the most precious thing for a lot of us. You know, to spend time with the family, to just enjoy maybe even just taking care of yourself for every once in a while. So if you're able to make money from your mind and you're able to create a product and you're able to create that product so well that it gives you the free time to be able to think of new ideas and new products so that you can add to the octopus analogy so that you have a lot of other avenues to make that income, that free time and that risk, I promise you at the end of the day, you're going to be sitting there in the rocking chair later in life and thinking about, man, I'm glad that I stood up for myself and realized that I wasn't going to trade my time for money anymore. I'm amped up, boys. I felt I felt really big yesterday in, in the sense of like I, I can see where things are, are changing. And I can also see where there's a lot of people that still pretend. And they're able to pretend because of these cocktail parties and some of these expos, there's not really a, a actual like living soil nerd among them. There's people that know the vernacular, but that doesn't really get you too far when you're talking the nitty gritty. And so I'm excited because I think a lot of you are going to be able to fill those voids if you would just find that confidence within. 
And I know for many years I was down uh, on myself because I didn't have a degree and I chose to have these different paths. The reality is now with e-commerce is it doesn't matter anymore. If you're good at hustling and you've been good at that your whole life and you whatever, and you just kind of found a way to take care of yourself, I promise you, if you learn how to make yourself a website or you hire somebody like Kid Mac to make you a website, that you're going to be off the right. a springboard type approach because you are you, that's already how your mind's working anyway. And so now you start to see that like, holy shit, man. So you're telling me these products are 24 seven, no matter what I'm doing, I have the potential to make money 24 seven. That, that was the whole point of hustling in the game in the early days is that you would even offer that. Like, yeah, I'll meet up to you up to like midnight. You just let me know, man, blah, blah, blah. So you offer mm. these extra services. <laughs> Shopify offer, offers that now for like 60 bucks a month. 45 bucks a month, whatever plan you get. So it, it is a yeah. major game changer for people that, that are uh, small time entrepreneurs. I said my, uh, one of my boys, we talked about, I have a, you know, I have a tumbling business. I teach kids tumbling like gymnastics and stuff. And, um, I have a, I have my second oldest boy. We talked and he started putting in little candy machines in my, in my gyms and dude it's every time every week he goes up there he's pulling out seven dollars cash every time and he's been doing that for about two months now and that is an entrepreneurial spirit because he's starting to realize man i'm just sitting back i'm just sitting back doing nothing right i, I got to put the candy in when it needs it and then set back he, i'm teaching him to keep it clean you know make it look good keep it shiny you know like you respect it and keep it full like it's fresh you know and he's learning all that fun stuff but again, just teaching your kids because the <clears throat> my point being, your kids will watch you do this. Brian's kids and Mark's kids, they're watching them do this. My kids are watching me hustle right now. They know that I'm in here doing a live show because I'm doing this other business where dad makes soil and all kinds of stuff. And he loves it and it's stinky and gross and I don't know what it is, but that's what he's doing. He's making money in there and they understand that <clears throat> and that gives them a fire. It sets a bar for them also, right? They get, it sets the bar of my dad did it like this. And you know how you are. If you had that dad growing up, you're like, yeah, my dad did it like this, man. I'm going to do it. You take pride in learning those things from your dad because it's that tradition that gets passed down in you and it's in your blood and you fucking die for it, you know? And that, that's the stuff that you're giving those kids, man. That's what I'm teaching mine. I'm like, make that money on your own, man. Look, it's everywhere. The life is just passing by in waves and, and dollar bills float all the time. And if you're just looking for it, there's little avenues that are not taken. And that's what you're wanting to find right there. And teaching, I'm teaching my kids, just like you guys are. Teaching my kids, we hustle. We hustle hard so that we can be together. That's what we want. I don't want to have to go out and work a lot of hours and get get my pay and then come home and barely see you guys. We're going to hustle on the weekends when everybody else is resting. We'll hustle so that we can have longer days of being together. And I might have to be gone a few hours, but then I'm home a lot, man. I see my family a lot, but when the opportunity comes, I hustle it. And we all know that he's going to get it. He's going to make the money and then he's going to be with us for a long time. And that's a better life. That's, that's that mental healthy life that you, that I love. And I know you guys love. I mean, if you're really talking about value, that's probably worth a million dollars right there. Just uh, what it, what the life could potentially be is the freedom from it. And um, I don't know, man. There's there's something special about it when we when we decided to do this. And I, I again, I hope that it, it shows like in real time in a in a wholesome way, in a reality type way, no drama. Because uh, I love hanging out with the you guys because you're not that those kind of people but just straight to the facts straight to helping being a genuine human being putting in the work uh and at this day and age i uh, i don't know how you don't make uh make at least a small little business for yourself and let's say that you're committed to your career and it's like man i put in 15 years for this i there's no way i or you just don't have the confidence i guess yet to to think that it could happen for you but you do want to have a little bit of a business to pay that so you could maybe get a new car or what pay down some debts, whatever it is. That that aspect is real easy to do. I mean, you can build a Shopify website in a week, a quality website. You know, you take maybe a month or two realistically to teach yourself how to do it, and then you can get it done quicker than it took you to, to learn how to do that. And then that skill set is there for life. 
It literally is like once it's set up, Mark can attest to this. A Shopify website can be done by two dudes that aren't. <laughs> are we intelligent? Hell yeah. I like to I like to think about that kind of stuff. But are we at the level that a lot of our peers are at in in academ academia? No, not not what's not at all. I can't even pronounce a lot of the Latin words that Mark can. So just because of that aspect and maybe how I grew up and not in the the greatest uh, educational environments when I was younger and stuff and pronouncing words sometimes is rough. And I think I'm a little dyslexic sometimes as well. All of those things matter in academia and it, and it hinders you. And the ADHD hindered me, I know, sitting around, all that kind of stuff. But then at Expos, I, it's almost like I have a an upper advantage to a lot of these people. And maybe bartending came in a way too, where I'm able to talk to random people, ringing up people while I'm talking to others. And I think this show has helped me even too, because, uh, you know, behind the scenes, I'm usually talking and I'm running all this stuff. Behind, you know, Mark's saying this in real time, Kevin's saying it in real time. To do these shows, there's a lot of mental capacity it takes just to even keep it all flowing live talking to you guys. And so with all those skill sets, I think all of that compounds to where when I'm in front of the customer, I have the passion. And now that I put in the effort, I now have the education. And so eventually that customer wants to buy from me because they can see that like this is what I live and breathe. That's why I've strategically only wanted to focus on isopods. So my customer knows that that is where my focus is at. And I think if you trace too many of these little rabbits, you're going to get what uh, we used to joke that's getting proper fucked from uh, I think it was like lock, stock and two smoking barrels where they race those dogs. I mean, when you want too many rabbits, man, you're going to miss that main rabbit. And I've just focused on the main rabbit, put my head down. I see that these boys are doing the same thing, being on am I beneficials, not not focused on a, a variety of different things outside of, of his comfort zone and his peer group. And then Kevin, I would say in the last, what, six months? You've kind of come on that same way where you realize, all right, what products do I want to bring to market? And now that I have these products to market, I'm going to kind of data test or whatever the right verbiage is to see what my customers actually think is a quality product. Because you as, as an entrepreneur might think that, oh, man, everybody's going to love this isopod. And I brought that isopod to market thinking that, oh, man, this is going to sell. And not that many people are into it. So then you got to kind of pivot and be like, all right, well, what people, let me try this other thing. or so I've never found success the first time I was doing anything. Uh, I always had to try again and find a new avenue. Um, and once that started to take off, now I have a variety of different isopods that I know firsthand with experience, what works, what doesn't. And there are very few people um, in the country that can say that. So and there's also like, um, there's a panache, right? Like there's a, you have Kevin, like the, you're a perfect example of kind of the panache I'm speaking of. But to explain further, you have like your academic side, and then you have your like you know your your blue collar side. And a lot of times, it's they don't speak or talk or think on the same wavelength, right? And being able to translate between those two things is is a gift is um is a skill unto itself and i think something that everybody needs to remember especially in their own expertise is like people have to understand what it is that you're saying right like perfect example would be the architect talking to the plumber <clears throat> you know they're not going to talk on the same wavelength because the architect has no idea how to turn a wrench and the plumber has no idea how to put together a building schematic, right? But having an understanding to an extent where you can explain these things, I think, is something that is so much needed, but also something that people for whatever reason don't feel comfortable doing right like um and maybe it's not, it's not necessarily like on the academic side i guess would would be uh you know like not being able to dumb it down right not being able to kind of suck your pride up um and, and explain it in a way that more people can understand <clears throat> yeah. so 
Um, I just wanted to add that because that's where Kevin and Brian and Marco uh, really crush is being able to to maybe take the the literature right and then digest it down to the people that maybe don't have the have the time or the mental capacity or the attention span to understand that shit and uh yeah so yeah knowledge has to be palatable knowledge has to be palatable it has to be able to be consumed yeah man that's a train you know that's a trained skill a, a good orator knows methods and tricks in speaking to keep people's attention right to to prepare them to move on to the next thing you're about to talk about you know to remind them of what you have said so that what you're about to say makes even more sense yeah there's some there's some people that are that are really good at speaking mine mine came through training like mine came through having to speak in front of boards of doctors and and defend the you know whenever you write a paper on something you have to defend the merits of your position you will have to defend why you wrote something and explain it and they will they'll ask you about five different authors you know they wrote on the same topic well have you read them and what do you think about what they have to think and you get to where you can really <clears throat> convince somebody yeah you know what i'm saying you learn to be convincing you learn to be confident and people like that i like a guy named jordan peterson i'm sure you've heard of him before he is a <clears throat> he's excellent he's excellent at explaining things in in pictures and that's what kind of helps me people people kind of create a picture of an idea and then you're like oh yeah i'm all in that picture now i can look all around and i can really get the idea but he he creates he creates ideas in picture form that's kind of same thing i try to do help you see it while i'm talking about it is a it's a fun way but yeah man i love teaching this stuff guys this is my home plate it's all about the, I don't like the lecture part. I don't like just giving a speech. I like for somebody to ask me a question and then we will chase every rabbit hole we can find, you know, and then, then, you know, so much knowledge, not just about that one point, but you know, all the knowledge around it too, that helps you, you know, connect to have a better understanding. We just got our first promotional sound snippet right fucking there, dude. T snag snip right there that's gonna be uh for next week um yeah, so that's cool. a i would say that's what we ask of you guys uh that that are you know, especially the early crew is just to to hopefully let other people know that we've made the switch we're on youtube hitting the like button every time you watch a video when everybody says all that stuff obviously the reason why they say all that stuff is because it really does matter so if you did like it and you can make a comment that that makes a huge thing, especially at the beginning when you have like 68 views and uh, you get 40 likes. I mean, all of a sudden that will allow YouTube to allow that algorithm to show that to more and more people. So, yeah, uh, what is Teaching it? Like engaging with the content that you guys are watching is the best way to help this show. There we go. Uh, we promised that we were never going to like put the show behind some kind of uh, super expensive paywall just uh, help us get it out there. And I'm, I hope that you guys can see that we're living what we're talking about, you know? Like even with the with the Future Canvas project, I've prided myself on never having to need sponsorship with that. And other people do. And I think there's two ways to look at it is either I'm putting in all the time and effort to put in such a quality show for another company or brand because I got to do what they say. Or truthfully i probably put in 75 percent of a show where i don't i don't have time to put in as much effort as everybody else to their podcast but we can still get them out weekly and you still have the uh, time and effort to enjoy your life and so I, mean, they, I hope that these are kind of the wisdoms that we give you is there's not enough hours in the day to chase everything and so you're not going to be good at everything so you got to dial this shit into one or two things and maybe a hobby and then enjoy it with your family and that is it if you want to find success, I think that's, I guess the blunt truth of it is that you got to dial in whatever you're going to do and then you got to get really good at that. And so you can't have a bunch of different hobbies out there constantly doing a bunch of different things um, and having your entrepreneurship be the thing that you work on, you know, an hour a day. I actually heard somebody say that to me one time and I, and I love the person dearly, but I asked them about their entrepreneurship and 
she she proudly told me that she was working on it an hour a day and I, that's disheartening man you're never going to find success if you work on anything for just an hour a day i promise you that maybe at the beginning like little incremental things but if you're trying to make something become a hot from a hobby into a full-time business it will never happen ever 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 did i watch the I watched um, Tony Robbins talk uh, talk about oh Golden State Warriors three point shooter what's his name uh, Stephon Stephon Curry yeah. he was talking about how many shots he takes in a day and he he times that out with a week and then a year and then basically a lifetime but it turns out you know he's shooting around three point two million shots in a lifetime. But then in his basketball games and his basketball career, the shots that he takes compares to those practice shots where it wasn't even 0.1%. And the shots that he made was even a lesser percent. But it was all about the shots he made in the game is because of this hard practicing, long hours of practice, working it, working it, working it. And it's not out of duty. It's out of passion. He just says, I love basketball. I'm going to get great at it. Watch me. You know, and he just committed to the process. He, you know, you you slavishly commit to something so that you can have freedom in it. That's the irony of that's the irony of life. You must put slavish devotion into something, and then there'll be a time when it switches to you have freedom to show everybody how great you are at this thing. But it only came through that slavish devotion, right? So that 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 was a that was a beautiful thing to see that it's a little bitty percent of shooting a free throw, shooting a shot. But outside of that game, he's hustling, hustling, hustling. And that's just the life that I, that I think we live. It's the lifestyle. It's the lifestyle. And the lifestyle pays off on those little, on those little moments, those sales, those, those connections and things like that. But it's just, man, it's the lifestyle you live. It's fun. So benefit from that lifestyle too. It's going to be a good one, man. I can already tell. The fact that we can have this where people will remember what some of this was said and uh, who knows where it'll go. We could have other uh, uh, guests and stuff. I mean, this, there's just so many opportunities when you just start something off. And, uh, here we are, day one, uh, kicking it off after a year, I guess, of almost practice. Most people wouldn't yeah. even put a year into something. The three of us put a year into practice, if you will, to wherever this leads and and might i remind know. we don't know might i remind you that i watched this show i watched you and mark marco and or sorry brian and mark uh and one time you are like hey so you want to come on and talk for a while i was like heck yeah let's do it and i was i've been on ever since <laughs> yeah you have dude it's been a great addition dude um absolutely yeah, yeah, that's what i mean hey it just just seems to happen if you're putting in the work and you'll notice there are a lot of people that came out with podcasts a lot of people that even put out little snippets and stuff but they fade away because most people will not put in the consistency week after week after week and they realize or I, I would think that eventually they realize that there's not a lot of money in uh, YouTube unless you are uh, like some kind of huge gamer or something and at the level that we're at, there is no money in, in YouTube. You would have to get a sponsorship. Or you get so good at educating that your customers just want to support you because they appreciate what you're offering. And that's what the three of us have approached uh, for over a year now. Uh, and I hope that it continues, that you guys just can see week after week after week that more people are supporting what we're doing. I had one of the best weeks I've ever had last week. Awesome. Good job. Yeah, and that's from putting in the work with you guys. I mean, there's, there's no magic formula that you, the three of you, it's not like Kevin found this magic formula and then he told me about it and then I told Mark about it and the three of us are sitting over here like, whoo, you know? There is no magic formula to what any of the three of us are doing other than showing up and putting in the work. And that's why I think not a lot of people can attain what we're doing is because putting in that work is the part that everybody's like, it's not going to happen for me. So you got anything special going on this week, Brian, before we sign off? Do you guys want to do some shout outs real quick? Um, you got your show coming up or your not your show, your class, um, which it, you're, you're probably going to do like a kind of a tester run on that sh that class. And hopefully, you know, I can 
I'll, I'll def if when I have some more um, time to plan, I'll definitely plan on coming out to Denver for the next one because uh, I'd love to. I'd love to get up there and and put my piece in for sure. Um, but yeah, anyways, you got any shout outs or anything else going on? Yeah, uh, I mean the goal is to kind of do my own kind of build up on this so that I don't waste uh, your time, Mark or Kevin's time. But eventually I'd love to have you guys be a part of this kind of stuff. I think uh, I'll be able to find some IT help even maybe, you know, I, I'm even going to reach out to Kid Mac about some of this stuff. Uh, but if we're able to, to broadcast and all of the, the big vision, I guess, behind the scenes that I have at this super fancy place here locally where I live, uh, there's a lot of opportunity. There's even an auditorium in this like mini indoor stadium where uh, like kind of fading artists and, and comics at the end of their career still make a little money for themselves. And so it'd be a perfect place, I think, for the bioactive reptile ish type community uh, to potentially have a foothold of where I can continue to put in content and then reach out to guys, experts such as yourself to kind of continue to just layer this thing so that more people see us as uh, influencers and something positive to the hobby instead of just taking from the hobby. Yeah, very good. <clears throat> always, always interested in something like that. <laughs> uh, whoa, hang out. That's just yeah. how we were both doing it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, man. Yeah, that sounds fun, Brian. That's a whole whole new little avenue right there. Just to create to create. I mean, it's there, but you're also there to create what it looks like, you know, how you approach it, how you attack it, put your spin on how you're going to edu educate these people, you know. That's really cool. Copy the playbook too. If you've been thinking about running classes, I I use Ticket Spice because they actually have the lowest fees and you can use it on your phone and all that kind of stuff. But then you also want to use Eventbrite. Eventbrite charges a lot more and they're kind of dicks about stuff and all these like other cons, but Eventbrite works really well for search engine optimization. So the money that I lose in Eventbrite is okay because it's in a way paying for my marketing for the class. And if you understand or you understand this stuff already or you want to learn how to do this kind of stuff, uh, the first page of Google is the only thing that matters. Uh, and so when you're trying to sell classes, it's hard to get your classes up there in time for people to give a shit if you only give it a week or two weeks. So I try to give it at least a month, two months. And I definitely use Eventbrite because it has a stranglehold on other uh, event type like uh, mm -hmm. Meetup or some of the other ones that you've probably heard of. Eventbrite, for whatever reason, is the top dog. And so I pay those fees to get the word out and that that is like inside i promise you in, information that i wouldn't share with uh anybody really outside of these walls I and mean, it's eventbrite it's ticket spice and then it's getting your name out there so that people want to come back to your class and then that's the same kind of snowball as then people say hey i watched this class it was pretty fun i got this little setup now the guy taught me how to do it uh, and then you're off to the running we have another income source for yourself doing the same thing um now i'm now i'm able to provide the products uh there's cherries on top so just a lot of fun stuff man and i've been working on this stuff for over a year now some of this other stuff for probably a year and a half so it's not like it just this didn't just happen it's just all this stuff is coming my way because i've been working on it for so long so kev you got anything special going on other than the bundles being up at okcalyx with two x's.com that's right bundles are up we got all kinds of bundles all kinds of inputs imos genetics fims regs come along with it so go check out okcalyx.com shout out to kid mac he set all my websites up or website up shopify up all that stuff he's one of those guys man that you need on your team for sure go check out okcalyx on instagram my email is okcalyx.com. And uh, the only thing I got is I'm going to be running a uh, springtail sale while I'm gone uh, for the next week. So uh, all orders will go out the following Monday, but uh, stay, po stay tuned for that. 
And uh, sweatshirts are still up on the website. Uh, appreciate you guys. Appreciate your time. And uh, until next week, let's get this thing rolling on YouTube, man. The, the quality is so much better. The experience is so much better. And uh, you guys just look all around so much better. So uh, love you guys. Enjoy it, everyone. Thanks for watching.